This club used to be called Soho, but now it's just so-so. I guess they didn't make it. You just weren't good enough. Hey, Loud Winners, it's Loudy6 here with another video. And I had a really interesting idea because when I was in America and I came back to China, it, I kind of realized like some of the things you can and can't do in both respective countries. For example, when I was in America, I was driving like crazy. I was being a really aggressive driver and sometimes I would beep at people that were pulling out of their driveways and stuff. And I realized that there's a lot of things you can and can't do in America and can and can't do in China. And they're both completely, completely different. So today I'm gonna to talk about five things that you can only do or see in China versus America where these things would not be okay. I hope you enjoy the video. Now, don't pay attention to the guys behind me. I chose a very ridiculous location to film, but it's because I'm outside of a club. Now, what I'm gonna talk about right now is the prevalence of underage drinking and underage smoking. Now, in China, there is kind of a legal limit or a legal age for smoking and drinking, but that is never, ever, ever followed. But you think that actually mean that you see a bunch of kids running around drunk and getting into their dad's liquor cabinets and drinking baijiu and all that kind of stuff. But actually, I found it to be the opposite. Now, when I lived in America, we used to sneak up to Canada across the border because the drinking age was lower than in America at the age of 21, which I find absolutely ridiculous. So what it caused was this, was this kind of like binge drinking culture for me. So you'd go and pay someone to go buy beer or liquor outside of a liquor store or something like that. And the risk for that person is possible jail time and we could get in big trouble too as kids. But here in China, kids can just go to a convenience store, they can go to a bar, they can go to a club, and they can drink all they want. Now, I did have a student when I first went to Inner Mongolia, in the back of my classroom, my first class, I kid you not, drinking a beer at 8 a.m. and smoking a cigarette in the class. That doesn't happen so much anymore. And like I said, there's not that much underage drinking and smoking going on because it's not seen as something that's super cool. Because of the drinking culture in China usually revolves around meetings or family or face, you'll see a lot of guys get together and just binge drink baijiu and just get absolutely smashed. There's a lot of alcohol poisoning problems and things like that. But what you don't see is kids doing the same thing because they see their dads and grandpas doing that kind of stuff. It's kind of not really, really cool to do so. However, with the prevalence of clubs nowadays and all these kind of bars that are springing up all over the place, I do see more and more younger people going out, but I don't see them getting plastered drunk. I see them having uh, one or two Budweiser's or uh, Bacardi Breezers or something like this. There's an influx of kind of lesser ABV, lesser alcohol, alcoholic beverages in China now that the younger people tend to drink. Now, although in some of my videos I said that people are smoking less and less, I see a resurgence of smoking nowadays, especially amongst, amongst younger girls. Now, in China, if a girl smoked when I first came here in 2009, you are kind of seen as low class or a prostitute even. It's a really bad stereotype, a really bad image that you're giving off as a woman. But I see a lot of younger girls now, middle school and high school age, that are kind of smoking. I don't know if it's to rebel against their parents or the system in China or Chinese culture or traditionalism in general, but I do see that kind of picking up right now. So if you're into drinking or smoking, you're gonna love it here because it's available, it's cheap, you can smoke indoors pretty much anywhere. You can walk around drinking a beer or some booze or whatever. You might get some nasty looks from people that think you're uh, kind of giving a bad atmosphere, a bad image to the public. But all in all, it's absolutely crazy that there's no legal limit or legal age for drinking and smoking. Be as racist as you want. Let your inner racial pride shine through. If you're a white supremacist, or if you're an Asian supremacist, you're gonna find heaven here in China. I'm just joking. But what I'm actually trying to say is that the PC culture or lack thereof in China is gonna bother some people. You cut that out now or you'll go home in an ambulance. Or it's gonna make some people really, really happy. The kind of whole PC nature of people back in the West that's kind of taken over Western countries does not exist here. So what I'm trying to say is that you will hear this and I swear to God, black people are dirty, Indian people are stingy. Jewish people are the best in the world because they're so smart and good at business. Even racist towards themselves. Chinese people can't drive. Chinese people have squinty eyes. Chinese people are super stingy just like the Indians. If you're fat, they'll call you fat. I take a shower, I'm triggered. I get in the car, I'm triggered. If you're poor, they'll call you poor. They'll call you dirty if your skin is too tan. Japanese are violent dogs. Northerners in China will call Southerners barbaric because of the things they eat. Southerners will call Northerners stupid because they tend to fight and get drunk. There is all kinds of stereotypes and anti-PC culture here in China. You will always have people be upfront with what they think about you. And you can also be judgmental towards Chinese people based on their appearances and some of the stereotypes against Chinese people as well. However, if you criticize Chinese culture or their government or just China in general as a nation, don't think for a second that you're gonna be safe. 
they tend to get pretty, pretty butthurt when you criticize their country. So they didn't allow us in the other building. I was supposed to be telling you guys that I, you can get into any building you want. And this is the first time I've been rejected. I think it's his fault. Yeah. Um, we did it, we did it. That guy was way more reasonable, but I had to say that my father was the boss of the tax department. <laughs> Go. We made it to the roof, but I reckon we could get even further. We can get even further. I don't know if this applies to China specifically, but there's a lot of big buildings and tall buildings that I tried to get access to in Hong Kong and in America. And when I tried to get up there to get some shots, it was either locked or I got yelled at and people are like, get the hell out of here. Now, that's not true in China because actually I just chose this random building out of nowhere and me and Prazi climbed to the top and I'm actually just standing here on the top of Huizhou. It's awesome. Now in China, pretty much every time I see a building, whether it's an apartment or a business or a hotel, they have access that's unlocked to the roof. And usually this is for maintenance people, but there's actually like locks on it that are never actually used. So people go to the roof and kind of just hang out. You can see laundry being hung up. You can see people drying vegetables and meat and all this kind of stuff if it's, a, if it's an apartment building. And also as a tourist in any city in China, you can go up to pretty much any building, get up on the roof, and it's amazing to get really, really cool views of the cities because there's something really special about Chinese cities, especially nighttime views of Chinese cities because the buildings are tall, the lights are neon, and it can be an awesome place to kind of chill with your friends and just have a beer. It's really, really cool stuff. Now, of course, there are farmers markets and wet markets and all this kind of stuff in Western countries. But the big difference is that the affordability in China of fresh produce is mind blowing. I'll tell you what, I started basically learning how to cook in China because when I went to the markets, it was so entertaining to find all these ingredients that I didn't really know what they were. It was so much better than going to the supermarkets where I'd get all that kind of prepackaged nonsense food because you know that the farmers grow their own food and then bring it there, sell it to you for a reasonable price. And although you might have to haggle down the price sometimes at these farmers markets, that in itself is a bit of a game too. Another thing is that the diversity of animals you can find being sold kind of rivals a zoo. So if you don't want to waste your money on a ticket to go to the zoo to go check out all the uh, aquarium animals and all that kind of stuff, just go to the market. It's free and you'll see stuff, you know, sometimes like I've seen um, parrotfish and aquarium fish being sold as food, sharks, turtles, uh, all kinds of weird species of frogs and all this kind of stuff. It's the most entertaining thing you can do here. It's unbelievable stuff. A lot of people complain about not being able to find ingredients to cook Western recipes in China, and that's just BS. Because if you go to the markets, you can pretty much find any fresh produce or any herb or spice that you really need to cook anything, whether it's Italian or French cooking, even Chinese cooking or Japanese cooking, you can pretty much find anything you need. Another really handy tactic is if you go to the supermarket and buy something, you're not gonna get instructions on how to cook it. And I've challenged myself by going to the wet market and finding ingredients and I don't know what it is and ask them how to prepare it. And usually the vendors actually know how to prepare the ingredients and how to prepare the recipes. And they give you tips and tricks and help you kind of prepare the ingredients for what you're about to cook that night. It's awesome stuff. Now the next one's gonna seem absolutely ridiculous because what I'm about to say is you can eat authentic Chinese food in China. Well, of course you can. But what my point is, is if you go abroad, the only time you're gonna eat authentic Chinese food and not Americanized or Westernized Chinese food or Jap Japanified Chinese food is if you go to a Chinatown. Now, a lot of people don't live near Chinatown, especially where I come from in rural New York. I grew up thinking that Chinese food was lo mein and General Tso's chicken and uh, beef and broccoli and all this kind of stuff. By the way, if you haven't seen her video, eating Chinese, uh, American Chinese food, go check it out. Anyway, my point is that if you come to China, you will be able to experience real Chinese food with very little effort. Now, the wonderful, the most wonderful thing about that is actually every province in China, and there's 32 of them, has a different cuisine. And it's kind of like saying, oh, New York food is different than California food. It's not, it's absolutely not. You can go to the same chain restaurants, and yeah, local people like in the past used to cook different things, but China's kept the tradition of keeping local cuisine local. And what I mean is if you go to uh, Jiangxi province, like I did the other day, eat Jiangxi food. If you go all the way up to Xinjiang in the west of China, you can eat uh, amazing kind of Muslim food or Middle Eastern food. Go to Inner Mongolia, you're gonna have the best goat or barbecue lamb of your entire life. You go up north to Dongbei in the northeast of China, you're gonna eat hearty, hearty food that might even remind you of some stuff that you eat in the west. You go down south, you go to Sichuan, you go to Hunan province, you're gonna be burning your mouth off with the spiciest stuff you've ever had in your life. 
Uh, you come down here to Guangdong, where we are right now, you know, you have some of the most ornate, amazing, kind of beautifully prepared food you've ever seen, and you wouldn't expect it to come out of China. You can go to Fujian and experience amazing, amazing seafood. The culinary diversity of China is almost limitless. And the best thing is that if you live in a fairly decent sized city, you can use apps and different programs and look online to find different province food around your city. So, for example, right now, we're not eating Cantonese food. The other day, me and Prazi actually went to an Inner Mongolian restaurant where people were from Inner Mongolia. There's all kinds of awesome restaurants from different places in China that you can experience in pretty much every Chinese city. You cannot pass that opportunity up. I hope you enjoyed the video, Lao winners, and next time I will do some things that you can only do in America that you can't do here in China. I hope you guys find these uh, videos very useful. And thank you so much to everyone out there that is my patron. I want to give you a huge shout out. You guys are really helping me out and helping this channel to kind of grow into something a lot bigger. So stay tuned for a lot more videos coming up. Also, if you didn't check out Prazi's video, he also covered some things that you can only do or see in China as well. So go check that out too. Link is in the description. Thank you so much, Lao winners, and I will catch you on the next one. So in this video, we're talking about the difference between eating at restaurants in the countryside or rural China versus in the cities. Now, the nice thing about these rural restaurants is that you can actually, wait, let me do that again. Now, there's a massive difference between eating in these two places because number one, if you go to the cities, you can actually find quite high-end and expensive food. Is that you can actually go back into the kitchens and take a look. Hey, Swagger, we can see the food. Can you see the food? 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 Can you see